Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. This is White Tail Rendezvous Podcast, episode number 233. On today's show, you hear from Cole Setzinger, otherwise known as Cole Mountain 88. Cole's got some really interesting tips, lessons learned, and how to run a gun, be a stealth hunter, and use contours, mini food plots in the timber, in the hills, in the mountains of Pennsylvania. Cole's got a lot to share, so listen up. Hey, listeners, don't forget to text 33444 Food Plot for your free Food Plot ebook. Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous. Hey, folks, we're heading out to Pennsylvania, southeast Pennsylvania to be exact, and we're going to connect with Cole Sightsinger. And Cole, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Bruce. I appreciate it. Hey, in the warm-up, we talked about lessons learned, and we talked about um, your relationship on pro staff with flatline whitetails. So, hey, let's just start off with flatline whitetails and talk to us about the pro staff, what you do, but more important, how you get on the pro staff. Yeah, definitely. Flatline whitetails uh, started up about two years ago, and I have been on their pro staff for currently just over one year. Um, I met the owners, Tyler and Nick Kravitz, and from there, you know, I pretty much fell in love with the concept of what they were doing. They wanted to do videography and share their stories through social media and online. So uh, I joined the pro staff to be a part of this team, and since joining, it has just been great. The camaraderie of the team, we all get along, and, you know, since I joined, it has definitely upped my level of hunting as far as whitetail goes. What I do for them, then, is just film my story and my hunt, and we share it with the rest of the world. Hopefully that people can learn and we learn from each other it's really been great now how do you know these guys how do you know nick nick and tyler are from uh northeast pennsylvania and they're a young couple of guys that were into hunting whitetails and wanted to start this this team and uh through one of our mutual friends um i, I met and was introduced to them at a meeting they had for flatline whitetails and uh from that meeting it pretty much took off they asked me to join the pro staff and uh haven't looked back since you know like i said we we're always bouncing ideas off each other and just feeding off of each other to continue hunting whitetails and, and hunting everything in general there's a uh, 11 guys on the team right now and we all hunt different animals and turkeys and fishing we have a guy out in colorado he goes elk hunting every year and uh you know it just feeds us all year long hey i'd love to talk to the guy out in colorado as you know i live in colorado springs and so i, I have done and, and will continue to do a lot of elk hunting so yeah, you know absolutely. maybe in the in the post show or, or send me an email i'd love to get a hold of him yep absolutely so, there's a lot of listeners that say, gee, I'd like to be in the outdoor industry. Gee, I'd love to be a pro staff, quote unquote, and I'm putting the quotes up. You know, I get free stuff, which you really don't because you work hard for whatever you get. And um, what's some advice that you would give them, um, guys or gals, if they really want to be a pro staffer? If they really want to do it in the outdoor um, each and every one of us, we work 40 hours plus a week for a living. So, you know, we're doing what we love and we're sharing it with everyone else. Um, making a living in the outdoor world is, is another side of it. I mean, obviously, a lot of people love to do that and want to get to that point. So the advice I would give is just to work hard and keep doing what you love. Um, you know, talk to everyone you meet and introduce yourself to new people, make new friends and, and just ride it out and see how it goes. You know, the harder you work, the more you're going to be rewarded in the end. Like you said, you met um, Nick and Tyler at a meeting. And how did you get invited to that meeting? I got invited to that meeting through a mutual friend who was actually part of the team at the time. And, you know, he knew what I did independently on my own, filming and chasing whitetails. And in his mind, he thought I'd be a good 
addition to the team. So he wanted to introduce me to the owners. And when I met the owners, you know, it just, it took off because we got along so well right off the start. And, uh, we've been on trips together since then. And, you know, it's just, they were a young group of guys just getting started and every year is getting better and better. Wow. Love to have them on the show. Let's talk about self-filming. Uh, let's spend a couple of minutes on that and, and talk about what it really takes and, and, and some of the equipment that you use. Yeah. Self-filming is no easy task. Um, when I grew up, when I was younger, I would be behind a video camera in front of my dad or my sister or my brother before I could even hunt. And, uh, then when I decided I wanted to keep capturing these films when I was 16 and old enough to hunt on my own, I started with a real small camera arm that just screwed into a tree and my little HD handy cam. And uh, it took years before I could get a kill on camera. And I was young. But now since then, I've upgraded to better gear that's easier to use in the tree. Um, I currently am filming with a Sony NX camera. So it's a much higher end camera. And uh, we use muddy camera arms, which allow us to maneuver the camera around the tree very easily. Setup and being comfortable with your stuff is most important when it comes to self-filming. Self-filming is not easy to do. You have to be able to move the camera, get it in position while focusing on making the shot count and making an ethical shot at that so i probably to date have about four or five deer shots self-filmed and then whenever we can we also team up so it's easier if you can get a buddy to go with you in the stand but then there's good and bad to that as well you have twice the scent in a tree stand and twice the noise and movement walking in and out of the stands so you know there's good give and take to everything but I do a lot of self-filming, and uh, I actually captured my buck last year on self-film and had sort of a video problem where it was almost like punching the record button twice, but it was a freak accident, and just as I was drawn back ready to shoot, my camera shut off. So no. self-filming is tough, and what can go wrong will go wrong. Yep, I was at full draw, and you see my bow lower down onto the animal, and it shuts off right there. <laughs> so oh, the- man. Oh, the most important part of the film, getting the shot, and that's where it decided to <laughs> give me a problem. Um, all too often, self-filming, you run into problems, but I didn't expect that one. I don't know if I bumped the record button while I was at full draw with my body against the camera. I was in real tight quarters with the camera between my body and the tree, and uh, yeah, I just didn't get it done, but regardless, we have the share, the story to share, so you know we have everything before and after, and, and a long story at that now since we're talking about stories um you've got a just a gorgeous um a buck uh, mature buck with a, a split g2 and you said um his g3 was also split so can you share a little bit about that buck and and how you ended up harvesting him yeah absolutely i uh i bought my home here in 2012 and the following year i had purchased 10 acres all mountain land right adjacent to my land at my house and i didn't hunt it that year um, in 2014, I hunted it one single day and I shot a buck with my bow um, out of one tree stand um, just in the middle of a flat. And then the following summer, 2015, I had the trail cameras out. I actually installed a watering hole because I'm up on a mountain and there was no water in just about every direction I could go <laughs> as far as my neighbor's land goes. So I put a watering hole in. I dug a hole out. I actually used a baby pool at the time and put it in the ground and filled it with water. And needless to say, every animal on the mountain would stop and check out that watering hole. So it was a great addition to my land. Um, my tree stand wasn't too far from there. I had a trail camera over the watering hole and I got a picture of this split G2 buck. I named him Parker at the time. And all summer long, he was the big biggest and most mature buck to show up on my property. So needless to say, when it came to hunting season, he was my target. And even all summer, I was questioning the age of this buck, whether he was a great three and a half year old, or if he was older in Pennsylvania, I would target any buck pretty much three and a half years or older as being a good buck in Pennsylvania. And, uh, and that was my goal. So the season started off great. The opening day, early season in September, I had, uh, 
decent, I'd say about 110 inch eight pointer come right under my tree and uh, I opted to pass him. And throughout the whole season, I passed three or four more buck, which was something I hadn't done a whole lot in the past. Leading into fall then, uh, I had continued to get pictures of this buck. I only had three tree stands on my 10 acre property, one up high, one in the middle and one down low. Um, it took all the way through archery season. I never got a shot at that buck. I had seen him one morning and it was right at first light. I was opting to take a shot at him and he turned off the trail just beforehand, which actually played in my favor because the camera lighting for videoing that morning would have been very poor. Um, archery season ended and actually in our zone where I hunt, it stays open all the way through rifle season. So statewide archery had ended and I can continued to hunt all the way through into rifle season, which would take us into December. In December then, opening day of rifle season, as I have for the last several years, I take my bow out. I don't pick up a gun to, to chase these deer. I just find it more rewarding to go after them with a bow. And I have attempted many times to shoot a buck, a mature buck, in rifle season with my bow. I've gotten close in the past, but it failed most of the time. Um, so the first Saturday of rifle season, my, my hopes and dreams of actually getting this buck were, were dwindling. Rifle season in Pennsylvania, the deer seemed to lock down or get shot by neighbors or just disappear in general. So uh, forcing myself to wake up this Saturday morning, it was December 6th, was not the easiest. I'd hunted probably 20 to 25 days out of one or two stands just for this buck. Moving in on that morning, I, uh, I was just real carefree pretty much. I walked in the same way I always do. Got in the stand. I had seen a smaller buck early in the morning, and it had taken till about nine o'clock in the morning, uh, two and a half hours in at least, till a, a doe and two fawns worked into my poor man's food plot, I call it. And I did it with a rake and just hard work over the summer. I had some oats growing in there and clover, and a doe and two fawns walked in, and within about a minute, I see this rack just glistening in the sunlight on the other side of my food plot. And I instantly saw it and knew that's Parker. And I couldn't believe he was alive still, being the first Saturday in rifle season and on his feet at nine o'clock in the morning working through my property. As quickly as that happened, he walked into the food plot at about 40 yards and I got myself ready, positioned the camera. I had taken some footage of him for about 30 seconds and he started moving at the same time I started moving to get my camera in place. Um, he comes in to 15 yards. I draw back. I knew my camera was on. I shot. I knew my shot was a little far back and he took off running. Um, went back to replay the footage, didn't get the footage, decided to wait till the next morning to go in after him. And this is where being part of a team like Flatline Whitetails really came in. All these guys drove from anywhere from one hour to three and a half hours away down to my house on a Saturday night so that they could be there to help find this buck on Sunday morning. I gave him plenty of time to, re to, you know, to expire overnight. And we found him the next morning about a half an hour into the track job with all my friends at my side. It was it was really great to be able to harvest wow. a four and a half year old deer on 10 acres of land in Pennsylvania with the bow and rifle season at that. <laughs> it just really well, all came together. Is it a pinch point, your land or a funnel or? Uh... It is a long, narrow piece that runs from the bottom of a mountain up over the top. Um, the only thing I have going is my house and my neighbor's house on the top funnel the deer either below my house or above my house. And I hunt specifically this flat that is about halfway up the mountain. And I walk straight out. I keep my trail in and out clear so I can get in and out quiet. And then my watering hole is out on that flat. And the deer just seem to funnel through there to get to their bedding area, which is off my land. Interesting. And I hope you uh, took the notes like I did, listeners. Um, he's got 10 acres. He put in a water uh, a water hole. One, his trail is is cleared off. Do you use a, a power blower, or how do you keep it clear? I went in with a leaf blower about the first week in November, in the middle of the day once, and I walked directly from my driveway all the way to my tree stand, and leaf blew about a four foot area, and it stayed clear for over a month. So think about that, because um, I do. I've I've got one stand. I love to hunt during the rut. 
it's just a, a great pinch point. And the mistakes I've made in the past is that I don't keep all the, the leaves off the trail. And unfortunately, because it's where it's set up, those deer know as soon as I hit the trail, they know I'm there. Yep. There's no question, no question in my mind. Absolutely. And they're, you know, up to uh, the furthest point probably is a quarter mile away, or they could be uh, 200 yards away from my stand, or or closer actually. And um, you know, lessons learned on on that. And so, you know, so the deer was four and a half years old, and um, good job. Yeah, I actually, for the first time, I sent his tooth out to be aged because I'd always wanted to do that, and I really wanted to know the exact age of this one. So I sent it out to get forensically aged, and it came back at four and a half. Um, As far as I could tell, I did not pinpoint who he was the year before, but every week or two weeks, he would show up on my property this year, or 2015, and I was able to get it done through a lot a lot of sits in the same tree stand (laughs) seeing a lot of deer butt him but waiting for the right one good for you that's great and we talked in the warm-up about your hunting tradition so let's spend some time on that cole and uh share you know why you are a hunter yep definitely i uh i grew up in a family that hunted my dad and my grandfather and my uncles and brother they all hunted and my dad and uncle were very serious archery hunters back in the 90s um my dad would go after and target mature buck back then when i was really little and at the time i didn't realize how much detail he paid attention to in in getting it done um and eventually as i grow older I realized the stuff that he did, he kept journals and he kept his trails cleared in and out and, you know, scent control freak to the max. And uh, it's, it really started to rub off on me the older I got and started to understand how it was. Um, my grandfather owns a cabin in Charlottesville, Pennsylvania, and that is where I grew up hunting, going with my dad. Even back then, though, my dad would wander off to other properties because he was in pursuit of mature deer and bigger deer. So, you know, he would go out and and do what it took to get them. Um, I grew up just going with him, um, shed hunting, videotaping, going deer spotting at night, uh, and eventually the addiction grew and grew the older I got. I just kept with it. And then my brother, who was older than me, he moved away to North Carolina. But if uh, if I had to credit anything to to him would be just the way he thinks about hunting these deer. He has, he has been the reason I've been rewarded with many, many deer. Um, just bouncing ideas off each other and him telling me what he would do. I tell him what I would do. And then we just hunt hard. And, you know, my whole family has done it for years and we still continue to do it. And it's still a tradition to, to go to our camp cabin and our property up there and, and hunt these whitetail. No, so you still go to the family cabin up where you had gone as a child? Yep, I have gone there pretty much every year since I was little. Um, last year, the only reason I took off last year was because of the specific deer I was targeting on my own property um, and allowing some of those other deer that are up on that property to hopefully reach a, an, an older age. Um, so I started bouncing around on properties now, but I still go back there um, and I will go back there this year after specific deer that I'm going to be after. The opening of gun season in Pennsylvania, how many people are in the forest or in the woods? It, it's got to be one of the leading states, I would say, as far as the number of gun hunters that go out. Uh, it just gets packed. And I remember when I was little, just, just listening to gunshots on opening day when I was sitting in the stand with my dad, I would just, you would hear gunshots go off all day, every day. And uh, the hunting pressure in Pennsylvania is very high, very high. You know, I, I just marvel, you know, and yet, you know, approximately 10 acres, 17 acres on your own, your own land. You took a mature buck that anybody would be happy, you know, uh, to harvest, to put down. Uh, well done. You've learned, you've had some good mentors. Yeah, absolutely. I, I credit my dad and my brother for a lot of that. And I still learn every, every hunt I go on, every deer that I take teaches me a lesson of some sort. And every deer that I don't take for that matter, you know, teach you a lesson. So it, it doesn't come easy. The more I do it, 
it, the more I learn that hard work is the only thing that really pays off. You can go out and get lucky, but if you want to do it consistently, you got to put in the time. Well, that's a great segue to the, um, the segment of lessons learned. And you said you got a few stories, so let's start chronologically. Um, the oldest one, then we'll walk work up to the newest one. Yeah, definitely. Um, oh, I've learned so many lessons over the years. Um, most of the, importantly, when I was younger, practice, practice, practice. Shooting a bow. If you don't practice enough, you uh, you may lose the opportunity when it comes the first buck I ever took with my bow and arrow I actually missed a buck just hours before out of the same tree (laughs) and uh that was simply because I rushed the shot and uh when the second buck came in then after I missed the first one I was much more calm because to me I had already been given my chance and something just calmed me down. Uh, I took my time on this one. I actually made a noise to stop it. And this was when I was 13 years old, um, made a noise to stop the deer on the second shot. And, you know, I made a shot and and was able to take my first buck with a bow. So that would be going back way far. Um, Obviously, back then, you don't think about these things as much, but that's definitely a lesson that I I think about now. Uh, The older I got then, running gunning on on one of my Pennsylvania buck, not just going to the same tree stand all the time. Um, one of the buck I was able to harvest take when my brother was up hunting with me, he and I both split up and we both went running gun set up. And by that, I mean, we took our tree stands in with us, found the spot we wanted to hunt, hung a stand and actually hunted it that same evening. And, uh, I was able to take a beautiful three and a half year old eight point, um, on that evening out of a tree that I never had a stand in previously. And, uh, I did it based on trail cameras and pictures so you know don't always stick to the same tree stands if you if you aren't having the luck and success that you need you got to get out and move and uh let's see the next one i would say would be ohio i hunted ohio with my brother in 2014 on a property it was private property a mutual friend got us permission onto there um and what we did was we studied maps we studied google earth and we studied maps um and we both picked out spots that we thought we would hunt based on maps and we compared our notes and came up with the tree stand spots that we would hunt uh, when we got out there it was a small property it was basically just like we thought a little bit thicker than than we expected but i hung a stand on a Sunday afternoon in the pinch point that we picked between a field and a pond. And on Monday afternoon at two o'clock, I was able to harvest and take my biggest buck with a bow just less than 24 hours after I got to Ohio. And I credit that all to studying maps and knowing the property that we were going into without ever laying foot on it. Interesting. You you shared a, a bunch of stuff uh, there, uh, and I'll just kind of recap: practice, practice, practice. And if you don't know your your gear, your rifle, your uh, your bow, um, you're hurting yourself. And you got to think about what kind of shot can I really take to harvest this deer, to put this deer down. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's it's our responsibility uh, to be at at our complete best. I talked to a gal who works for Bowtech yesterday, Amy Burnett, and she said, it's all muscle memory. Cause when you get on, on that target, when you're picking up that piece of hair, the piece of dirt on the, on the side of that buck, um, it, forget about thinking it's just going to be, you know, there it is. We breathe, release, whatever your sequence is. And, uh, and do what you need to do. But if you don't practice, then you'll never have that muscle memory that to do it. Yeah, 100%. Your thoughts on that? 100% right. Um, when the when the time and the moment comes to shoot, you, no matter how much you try to think, it just happens. And, you know, from the second you draw your bow back to you release that arrow, it's almost like your mind goes blank. And you, your body relies on that muscle memory. So the more you're practicing and the more you're shooting, the better that that becomes. Agreed on that. And then I run, I love run and gun because so many guys just get attached um, to their stand setups. And, you know, they're saying, well, this is where I'm going to go. It's the wind and uh, every other factor. I'm going to pick this stand today. And they never change it up. And, hey, I'm guilty of that. I've been hunting the same farm in Wisconsin for, you know, 50 years. This is our 50th anniversary. Wow. And we got, we got stands that have killed 
hundred, literally hundreds of bucks. Yeah. From those stands, not just me, but the whole family of which I was grafted into because they felt sorry for this this kid from New York. <laughs> out, I went to school in Wisconsin, so so the guy's bar I was working in said, why don't you come out and, and, and spend the weekend with us? We're going deer hunting. Nah, deer hunting. Can't ask for yeah, I've heard about that. that. Yeah, and, and so I did. And 50 years later, we're going to, we got a bunkhouse along the Baraboo River and we're going to, you know, celebrate that but awesome. you know that is great it, yeah it, it's just it's just part of deer hunting and it has nothing to do with putting deer down uh because we both pass deer now um we'll, yeah we'll take some does off the farm but we we pass bucks uh you know every single not every single day but uh, you know every single season we're passing a lot of bucks because you know we know there's some really nice bucks in there and if, if we shoot the smaller ones then we won't have a chance at uh, Mr. Wonderful, as we call him. Yeah, and yeah. you know, in saying that, but running, gunning, uh, folks, if you if you haven't figured it out, even on your property, there's some places that you could slip into, pop up a stand, uh, a hang on, and hunt it just like Cole did, and very quickly um, harvest a deer. Why? And this is my two cents, in my opinion, is because you the buck has patterned you in your stand guaranteed and he knows that but all of a sudden you cross it up with the wind and scent control all the things you got to do but if you cross him up then he's looking not at you but that at that stand set and and figuring hmm where is he and all of a sudden you've got a shot and you're not in my opinion, you're not more than 100 yards, 200 yards at most from your existing stand. Your thoughts, Cole? Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, that story I was describing, uh, I would walk by this tree just about every time to go to my normal stand setup. And, and these deer knew it. They they traveled between where I would park my truck and, and where I would hunt. And the element of surprise that night when I when I took my climber out and ended up in the tree closer to where they were, um, it ended in success for me and that's because the element of surprise and uh almost every time you go in for a first time sit somewhere it proves to be one of your best sits so i mean that right why there is that tell you. i don't you know it's why is that it must just be because those deer are not used to you being there and they have not patterned you in that area and they don't expect it so you know if you can get in there unexpected and that first sit is going to be key yeah because that that happens a lot folks and and so you First set typically be your best set, and in, in some of the places I hunt, I'll only hit, I'll only sit one stand three days in a row, and then I, you know, I leave it. You know, it might be ten days, it might be twenty days, it just depends before I even go back there. Yeah, yep. And on the flip side of that, with the split G two buck that I took last year, I hunted that exact same stand over twenty times in one season, <laughs> which is completely out of the normal for me but i knew on my small property in that area that was the stand to be in where my wind and everything was right and tree and exit and but you did your homework you got a clean trail so you know the only way they're going to know you're in there one see you um do you walk in without a flashlight I, I would walk into that stand without a flashlight yes and so they can smell you in dark 30 they can see something uh, but then if you're silent they they really don't know and so I would call that a stealth stand. Yes, absolutely. myself. You know, I call it a stealth stand in, in the contours, and you keep referring to it, you got a flat place. So the contours, and if you do this on Google Map, you can see, okay, it's a bench. I hunt elk, so I hunt elk on benches, and because it just it just makes sense to do that because critters yeah. like it easy for them as you like it easy for you in the mountains and the hills or wherever you're hunting swamps. It really doesn't matter. You got to figure out what's the optimum travel pathway, travel trail uh, through this land. Once you figure that out, then go in, get on the land during the winter. I like it during the winter time because you can see the tracks. Yep. But even even then, um, when the new foliage, new grasses come in, you can see you can see the trail. And we have on the farm, we got trails that are. I don't know how old they're older than I am. I'm 70 years old, so they're you know they're that old just because of the houses and the barns and the fences and the terrain and the saddle. Uh, I love hunting saddles, and because it's it's a natural travel corridor for these deer. And I I think in, at your place you could sit that every single day with the wind right, 
and you'd harvest a buck every year. As you said, you saw a number of bucks. So that's my two cents on that. Yep, I agree with you there. And it was the same tree stand that I took my buck in 2014 as well. So, yep, you're absolutely right. Just that that bench there leads those deer through that area. Wow, it's a, you know I, I I enjoy this type of discussion because a lot of people never think about it. And Cole, as we talked in the warm up, uh, thirty some minutes is going to go fast. We're 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 two minutes into our stop. So give a shout out to people and let's wrap the show up. Yeah, I'll give a shout out. Um, Flatline Whitetails, Nick and Tyler Kravitz. Um, you can check them out on social media and flatlinewhitetails.com and uh, all the sponsors that support them. And that's pretty much it. Now, what's your Facebook page? How, if somebody wants to get in touch with you, how would they do that? If you'd like to get in touch with me, you can get on Facebook or Instagram. Um, it's Cole Mountain Sightsinger. And uh, there is a story behind that. We might have to sh- save that for another time. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. I also thank thank my wife and uh, my kid for putting up with my obsession of hunting these whitetails. As everybody that is obsessed with it knows, um, you got to have the people behind you supporting you. <laughs> well, Cole Seisinger from southeastern Pennsylvania, thanks for sharing some really great insights. I mean, I got half a sheet of, of notes and just thank you so much for being a guest and I can't wait to have have uh, Nick and Tyler on the show and uh, I want to have you back to see how uh, the 2016 season goes. Absolutely Bruce, thank you for having me, I appreciate it very much Make sure you listen to the next episode of Whitetail Rondo We're fortunate to have Paige Darden who is the marketing director of my Topo. My Topo takes maps, combines it with technology to give you the best information you can have for during the hunt, before the hunt, and after the hunt. Stay tuned. I think you're going to like it. Hey folks, I hope you understand the importance of wearing proper hearing protection every time you fire around. One shot, can damage your hearing forever. Whether at the range or in the field, ESP is my hearing protection of choice. The custom fit allows all day comfort, while the technology within the device allows you to hear normal sounds like the rustle of leaves, the bugle of an elk, or the snort wheeze of a buck. Check them out at www.espamerica.com or call Jack Homa directly at 303 659 8844. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.